when we last met, Jesus asked the disciples who the people thought Jesus was. Today, questions about who's who and what's what continue. This time, however, we start with God clearly identifying God's self. When Moses asks what he's supposed to say when someone asks who sent him, God says, you tell them I am sent you. I am. That's a peculiar way of self-identifying. Theologians throughout the centuries have wrestled with this designation. We take it to be a proper name in this instance because God said so, but linguistically speaking, it comes across not as a name, but as a statement of being. I am. We know that God is beyond human understanding, so hoping that God would come out with a name that sounds more like one we would use for a person wouldn't really be consistent with that understanding. For God to self-identify in terms of being is actually the most genuine and accurate kind of name that there could be. God's name aligns with God's characteristics. God is. Anything we choose to put after that says more about us than it says about God. God knows exactly who and what God is. God is the very pinnacle of what being fully self-realized is all about. If only we all possessed such self-knowledge. In my experience, it seems like most people self-identify more like Moses in the first reading than God. When God tells Moses that there's a job that needs to be done, Moses asks, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh? Who am I? That's quite a contrast with I am. Moses does something after this encounter that seals his identity forever. He allows God to be present with him and be part of his life from that moment onward. God's invitation to be in a relationship is accepted, and that allows Moses to move toward his own self-understanding with the same clarity as I am. We enter into the gospel today, having heard Simon Peter establish Jesus' identity last week. Jesus asked, who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter responded, you are the Messiah. Jesus recognized that his ability to name Jesus was the result of God's abiding presence within him. This is a big step in the right direction for this disciple. Jesus then names him according to his characteristics. Jesus says, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. I tell you, you are Peter, the rock upon which Jesus will build the church. Names are important, but more important is how we identify ourselves and the characteristics we choose to live into. It's by these that others will know us and be able to recognize us. This week, Peter's identity is challenged when his characteristics fail to align with the identity he wishes to claim. He gets called by another name, but it's not one that he wants. Part of the process of discipleship is moving and flowing with the way we grow in our faith. Who we were and how we understood ourselves as children shouldn't apply to us as adults. Life experience matters. The more we practice the principles of our faith in those life experiences, the better we are at realizing what is genuine within us. Toward which features of Christianity do you find yourself most gravitating? Paul lists all sorts of features in his letters, gifts of the spirit, he calls them. Some are teachers, some are healers, and so on. We move into the gifts God has given us, and at the same time, 
move further toward our most genuine identities. In the letter to the Romans that we read in our second lesson today, Paul outlines for us the characteristics of discipleship identity. Let love be genuine, he begins. Love is in the primacy position in this list. Paul starts with the most important thing, love. We who are made in the image of love itself ought to be genuine ourselves. That's where Paul begins his teaching, at our very origins, with love. Everything after that is in orbit around love. This selection of verses from Romans reads like a big old love fest. This is arguably one of Paul's best writings. This passage is powerful. It's broad. It's Universal themes engage us in a way that lots of other passages don't. Hold fast to what is good. Rejoice in hope. Contribute to needs and extend hospitality. This, my friends, is a love fest until it gets hard. Just when you feel moved by all this love, Paul goes and tells us to bless those who persecute us and resist the temptation to avenge wrongs. If we're being honest with ourselves, a little place inside us is deflated just a little bit by Paul's astute recognition of our human nature. Paul appeals to our best selves in these verses. He calls us by our best names in hopes that we'll answer. He does so fully knowing the struggles we face when trying to live a life of faith that's as defined by justice and repentance and equity as it is by compassion, peace, and love. What makes Christianity both beautiful and difficult is its location at the intersection of these aspects of our being. We can cling to hope while at the same time find ourselves tempted to withhold blessings from those who would do us harm. Perhaps imagining heaping burning coals on the heads of our enemies makes it easier to feed them when they're hungry. In just a few verses, Paul artfully summarizes what Christianity expects of its followers in the midst of the complexities of life. Self-identifying as a disciple of Jesus Christ sometimes means making a choice in the moment about what characteristics we wish to claim. Perhaps Peter was still glowing from being called the rock upon which Jesus would build his church. I would be. But his words and actions we witness today in the gospel reveal a person who's chosen to stop growing as a disciple. Even after Jesus describes what is to happen, the future, the rest of the story, Peter chooses to stay in the past, in the glory days, that time when he got it exactly right on the first try. Who can blame him, honestly? He had a really good day. When's the last time you had a really good day? Like February. Paul encourages us to keep growing, keep claiming the characteristics that bring us closer to that genuine abiding place with God. Outdoing one another by showing honor creates holy habits. Loving one another with mutual affection is a way to build partnerships that provides support when things get tough. Both rejoicing and weeping together strengthens our community bonds. Holding fast to what is good makes it easier to bless than curse. When we are faced with the enemy, whatever that may be, and we're tempted to act in a way that is not consistent with who and what we claim as our identity, 
we will be strengthened by these other characteristics that we've built up over time. Like Peter, we will always be confronted with challenges to the identity we claim as children of I am and followers of the Messiah. So Paul gives us a reset button when we find ourselves in those crossroads moments. Tucked away neatly into the middle of this passage is the key. Paul writes, if it is possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloveds, there is always a possibility. Peace does depend on you. The good news that we get today is the recognition that abiding within us, encouraging us to grow and move with our faith, is the very nucleus of all creation and the source of all love. We don't have to understand it perfectly. God fully understands God's self without our help. Our job is to build upon our self-identification as followers of the, the Messiah, what it means and how it guides the choices we make. Because genuine love has revealed itself to us, we are able to overcome evil with good. Now, whenever anyone asks you if you self-identify as a child of God and a disciple of Jesus Christ, you can say, I am. And that's good news.